Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. Heidi is a classic novel written by Swiss author Johanna Shapiri. It was originally published in 1881 in two parts, Heidi's Years of Learning and Travel, Heidi Slayer You and You Wander Jar, and Heidi Makes Use of What She Has Learned, Heidi Kim Brachin, was E.S. Jellern Hat. The story has since become one of the most well-loved and enduring children's books, captivating readers of all ages with its heartwarming narrative and picturesque portrayal of the Swiss Alps. The novel tells the story of Heidi, a young orphan girl who is sent to live with her reclusive grandfather in the Swiss Alps. Her grandfather, who is initially gruff and distant, gradually warms up to her and they form a deep bond. Heidi's innocence, kindness, and love for the mountains begin to transform the lives of those around her, including her grandfather and a young disabled girl named Clara, whom she befriends in Frankfurt. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend. You both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. Chapter 7 The Unfriendly Housekeeper When Heidi opened her eyes on her first morning in Frankfurt, she could not think where she was. Then she rubbed them and looked about her. She was sitting up in a high white bed in a large, wide room with very long white curtains. Near the window stood two chairs covered with large flowered material and then came a sofa with the same flowers, in front of which was a round table. In the corner was a washstand with things upon it that Heidi had never seen in her life before. But now all at once she remembered that she was in Frankfurt. She jumped out of bed and dressed herself. Then she ran first to one window and then another. She wanted to see the sky and country outside. She felt like a bird in a cage behind those gray curtains. But they were too heavy for her to put aside, so she crept underneath them to get to the window. But she could see nothing but walls and windows. She felt quite frightened and ran backwards and forwards, trying to open first one and then the other of the windows for she felt that somewhere outside there must be the green grass and the last unmelted snows on the mountain slopes. But the windows remained immovable, try what Heidi would to open them. Suddenly there was a knock on the door and immediately after Tanette put her head inside and said, breakfast is ready. Heidi had no idea what invitation so worded meant and Tanette's face did not encourage any questioning on Heidi's part. Heidi was sharp enough to read its expression and acted accordingly. So she drew a little stool out from under the table, put it in the corner and sat down upon it and there silently awaited what would happen next. Shortly after, Miss Rottermeyer appeared. She seemed very much put out and called to Heidi, what is the matter with you? Adelaide, don't you understand what breakfast is? Come along at once. Heidi had no difficulty in understanding now and followed at once. Clara gave her a kindly greeting, her face looking considerably more cheerful than usual, for she looked forward to all kinds of new things happening again that day. Breakfast passed off quietly. Heidi ate her bread and butter in a perfectly correct manner, and when the meal was over and Clara wheeled back into the study, Miss Rottermeyer told her to follow and remain with Clara until the tutor should arrive and lessons begin. As soon as the children were alone again, Heidi asked, how can one see out from here and look right down onto the ground? You must open the window and look out, replied Clara amused. But the windows won't open, 
responded Heidi sadly. Yes, they will, Clara assured her. You cannot open them, nor I either, but when you see Sebastian you can ask him to open one. It was a great relief to Heidi to know that the windows could be opened and that one could look out. Clara now began to ask her questions about her home and Heidi was delighted to tell her all about the mountain and the goats and the flowery meadows. Meanwhile, her tutor had arrived. Miss Reiermeyer, however, did not bring him straight into the study but drew him first aside into the dining room where she poured forth her troubles. It appeared that she had written some time back to Mr. Cece Man to tell him that his daughter very much desired to have a companion. Miss Reiermeyer had wished for this arrangement on her own behalf, as it would relieve her from having always to entertain the sick girl. The father had answered that he was quite willing to let his daughter have a companion, provided she was treated in every way like his own child. But now she went on to explain how dreadfully she had been taken in about the child and related all the unimaginable things of which she had already been guilty so that not only would he have to begin with teaching her the ABC, but would have to start with the most rudimentary instruction as regarded everything to do with daily life. She could see only one way out of this disastrous state of affairs and that was for the tutor to declare that it was impossible for the two to learn together without detriment to Clara, who was so far ahead of the other, that would be a good excuse for getting rid of the child. But she dared not send her home without Mr. Seisman's order, since he was aware that by this time the companion had arrived. The tutor was a cautious man and said that if the little girl was backward in some things she was probably advanced in others, and a little regular teaching would soon set the balance right. When Miss Reiermeyer saw that he was not ready to support her and evidently quite ready to undertake teaching the alphabet, she opened the study door, which she quickly shut again as soon as he had gone through remaining on the other side herself, for she had a perfect horror of the ABC. She walked up and down the dining room, thinking over in her own mind how the servants were to be told to address Adelaide. The father had written that she was to be treated exactly like his own daughter, and this would especially refer, she imagined, to the servants. She was not allowed, however, a very long interval of time for consideration, for suddenly the sound of a frightful crash was heard in the study, followed by frantic cries for Sebastian. She rushed into the room. There on the floor lay in a confused heap, books, exercise books and inkstand with the tablecloth on the top while from beneath them a dark stream of ink was flowing all across the floor. Heidi had disappeared. Here's a state of things, exclaimed Miss Reiermeyer. Tablecloth, books, work basket, everything lying in the ink. It was that unfortunate child, I suppose. Yes, Heidi did it explained Clara, but quite by accident, she must on no account be punished. She jumped up in such violent haste to get away that she dragged the tablecloth along with her, and so everything went over. There were a number of vehicles passing, that is why she rushed off like that. Perhaps she has never seen a carriage. Is it not as I said? She has not the smallest notion about anything. But where is the child who has caused all this trouble? Surely she has not run away. What would Mr. Cece Man say to me? She ran out of the room and down the stairs. There, at the bottom, standing in the open doorway, was Heidi, looking in amazement up and down the street. What are you doing? What are you thinking of to run away like that? called Miss Rottermeyer. I heard the sound of the fir trees, but I cannot see where they are, and now I cannot hear them any more," answered Heidi, looking disappointedly in the direction whence the noise of the passing carriages had reached her, and which to Heidi had seemed like the blowing of the south wind in the trees, so that in great joy of heart she had rushed out to look at them. Fir trees. Do you suppose we are in the woods? 
What ridiculous ideas are these? Come upstairs and see the mischief you have done. Heidi followed Miss Ryermeyer upstairs. She was quite astonished to see the disaster she had caused, for in her joy and haste to get to the fir trees she had been unaware of having dragged everything after her. I excuse you doing this as it is the first time, but do not let me hear of you doing it a second time, said Miss Ryermeyer pointing to the floor. During your lesson time you are to sit still and attend. If you cannot do this I shall have to tie you to your chair. Do you understand? Yes, replied Heidi, but I will certainly not move again, for now she understood that it was a rule to sit still while she was being taught. When Clara had been placed on her couch after dinner and the housekeeper had retired to her room, Heidi waited for Sebastian who was coming up from the kitchen with a tray of silver tea things which he had to put away in the dining room cupboard. As he reached the top stair, Heidi went up to him and addressed him in the formal manner she had been ordered to use by Miss Ryermeyer. Sebastian looked surprised and said somewhat curtly, What is it you want? Miss, how can a window be opened? Why, like that, and Sebastian flung up one of the large windows. Heidi ran to it, but she was not tall enough to see out, for her head only reached the sill. There, now Miss can look out and see what is going on below, said Sebastian as he brought her a high wooden stool to stand on. Heidi climbed up, and at last, as she thought, was going to see what she had been longing for. But she drew back her head with a look of great disappointment on her face. Why, there's nothing outside but the stony streets, she said mournfully, but if I went right round to the other side of the house, what should I see there, Sebastian? Nothing but what you see here, he told her. Then where can I go to see right away over the whole valley? You would have to climb to the top of a high tower, a church tower, like that one over there with the gold ball above it. Heidi got down quickly from her stool, ran to the door, down the steps and out into the street. She passed a great many people, but they all seemed in such a hurry that Heidi thought they had not time to tell her which way to go. Then suddenly at one of the street corners she saw a boy carrying a hand organ on his back and a funny looking animal on his arm. Heidi ran up to him and said, where is the tower with the gold ball on the top? I don't know, was the answer. Do you know any other church with a high tower? Yes, I know one. Come then and show it me. Show me first what you will give me and the boy held out his hand as he spoke. Heidi searched about in her pocket and presently drew out a card on which was painted a garland of beautiful red roses. She looked at it first for a moment or two, for she felt rather sorry to part with it. Clara had only that morning made her a present of it, but then to look down into the valley and see all the lovely green slopes. There, said Heidi holding out the card, would you like to have that? The boy drew back his hand and shook his head. What would you like then? Asked Heidi, not sorry to put the card back in her pocket. Money. I have none, but Clara has. I am sure she will give me some. How much do you want? Five cents. Come along then. They started off together along the street and on the way Heidi asked her companion what he was carrying on his back. It was a hand organ, he told her, which played beautiful music when he turned the handle. All at once they found themselves in front of an old church with a high tower. The boy said, there it is. Heidi caught sight of a bell in the wall which she now pulled with all her might. If I go up to the tower you must wait here, for I do not know the way back and you will have to show me. What will you give me then for that? Another five cents. They heard the key turning inside, and then someone pulled open the heavy, creaking door. An old man came out and at first looked with surprise and then in anger at the children as he began scolding them. 
What do you mean by ringing me down like this? Can't you read what is written over the bell for those who wish to go up the tower? But I do want to go up the tower, said Heidi. What do you want up there, said the old man. Has somebody sent you? No, replied Heidi. I only wanted to go up and look down on the valley. Get along home with you and don't try this trick again, or you may not come off so easily a second time, and with that he turned and was about to shut the door. But Heidi took hold of his coat and said beseechingly, let me go up, just once. He looked round, and his mood changed as he saw her pleading eyes. He took hold of her hand and said kindly, well, if you really wish it so much, I will take you. The boy sat down on the church steps to show that he was content to wait where he was. When they had climbed to the top of the tower, the old man lifted Heidi up that she might look out of the open window. She saw beneath her a sea of roofs, towers, and chimney pots. She quickly drew back her head and said in a sad, disappointed voice, it is not at all what I thought. You see now, a child like you does not understand anything about a view. Come along down and don't go ringing at my bell again. On the way down they passed the tower keeper's room. At the far end of this was a large basket, in front of which sat a big grey cat. Heidi went up to the basket and broke out into expressions of delight. Oh, the sweet little things. The darling kittens, she kept on saying as she jumped from side to side of the basket so as not to lose any of the droll gambols of the seven or eight little kittens that were scrambling and rolling and falling over one another. Would you like to have one? said the old man who enjoyed watching the child's pleasure. For myself, to keep, said Heidi excitedly, who could hardly believe such happiness was to be hers. Yes, of course, more than one if you like in short, you can take away the whole lot if you have room for them, for the old man was only too glad to think he could get rid of his kittens without more trouble. But how can I take them with me, asked Heidi, and was going quickly to see how many she could carry away in her hands when the old cat sprang at her so fiercely that she shrank back in fear. I will take them for you, if you tell me where, said the old man, stroking the cat to quiet her. To Mr. Seisman's, the big house where there is a gold dog's head on the door with a ring in its mouth, explained Heidi. The old man had had charge of the tower for many a long year and knew every house far and near. I know the house, he said, but when shall I bring them and who shall I ask for you or not one of the family, I am sure. No, but Clara will be so delighted when I take her the kittens. If I could just take one or two away with me, one for myself and one for Clara, may I? Well, wait a moment, said the man, and he drew the cat cautiously away into his room and leaving her by a bowl of milk came out again and shut the door. Now take two of them. Heidi's eyes shone with delight. She picked up a white kitten and another striped white and yellow and put one in the right, the other in the left pocket. Then she went downstairs. The boy was still sitting outside on the steps. In a very short time they had reached the door with the large dog's head for a knocker. Heidi rang the bell. Sebastian opened it quickly and when he saw it was Heidi, make haste. Make haste, he cried in a hurry voice. Heidi sprang hastily in and Sebastian shut the door after her, leaving the boy, whom he had not noticed, standing in wonder on the steps. Make haste, little miss, said Sebastian again, go straight into the dining room, they are already at table, Miss Ryermeyer looks like a loaded cannon. What could make the little miss run off like that? Heidi walked into the room. The housekeeper did not look up. Clara did not speak. There was an uncomfortable silence. Sebastian pushed her chair up for her 
and when she was seated Miss Ryermeyer said sternly, Adelaide, you have behaved in a most unmanly way by running out of the house as you did, without asking permission, without anyone knowing a word about it, and then to go wandering about till this hour, I never heard of such behavior before. Meow, came the answer back. This was too much for the lady's temper. With raised voice she exclaimed, You dare, Adelaide, after your bad behavior, to answer me as if it were a joke? I did not dash, began Heidi dash, meow. Meow. That will do, Miss Ryermeyer tried to say, but her voice was almost stifled with anger. Get up and leave the room. Heidi stood up frightened and again made an attempt to explain. I really did not dash meow. 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 But, Heidi, now put in Clara, when you see that it makes Miss Ryermeyer angry, why do you keep on saying meow? It isn't I, it's the kittens, Heidi was at last given time to say. Ow. What? Kittens, shrieked Miss Ryermeyer. Sebastian. Tanette, find the horrid little things. Take them away. And she rose and fled into the study and locked the door. When Sebastian entered the dining room, Clara had the kittens on her lap and Heidi was kneeling beside her, both laughing and playing with the tiny, graceful little animals. Sebastian, exclaimed Clara as he came in, you must help us. You must find a bed for the kittens where Miss Ryermeyer will not spy them out, for she is so afraid of them that she will send them away at once, but we want to keep them and have them out whenever we are alone. Where can you put them? I will see to that, answered Sebastian willingly. I will make a bed in a basket and put it in some place where the lady is not likely to go. You leave it to me. He set about the work at once, sniggling to himself the while, for he guessed there would be a further rumpus about this some day, and Sebastian was not without a certain pleasure in the thought of Miss Ryermeyer being a little disturbed. After some time had elapsed, Miss Ryermeyer opened the door a crack and called through, Have you taken those dreadful little animals away, Sebastian? He assured her twice that he had done so, and quickly and quietly catching up the kittens from Clara's lap, disappeared with them. Miss Ryermeyer retired without speaking, Clara and Heidi following, happy in their minds at knowing that the kittens were lying in a comfortable bed. Chapter 8 Surprises for the Children The tutor had just been shown into the study on the following morning when there came a very loud ring at the bell. Sebastian opened the door and there stood a ragged little boy carrying a hand organ on his back. What's the meaning of this? said Sebastian angrily. I'll teach you to ring bells like that. What do you want here? I want to see Clara, the boy answered. You good for nothing little rascal, can't you be polite enough to say Miss Clara? What do you want with her? continued Sebastian roughly. She owes me ten cents, explained the boy. You must be out of your mind. And how do you know that any young lady of that name lives here? She owes me five for showing her the way there and five for showing her the way back. The young lady never goes out, cannot even walk, be off and get back to where you came from before I have to help you along. But the boy was not to be frightened away and said in a determined voice, but I saw her in the street and can describe her to you. She has short, curly black hair and black eyes and wears a brown dress and does not talk quite like we do. Oh ho, thought Sebastian, laughing to himself, the little miss has evidently been up to more mischief. Then, drawing the boy inside, he said aloud, I understand now. Come with me and wait outside the door till I tell you to go in. Be sure you begin playing your organ the instant you get inside the room. The lady is very fond of music. 
Sebastian knocked at the study door and a voice said, come in. There's a boy outside who says he must speak to Miss Clara herself, Sebastian announced. Clara was delighted at such an extraordinary and unexpected message. Let him come in at once, replied Clara. The boy was already inside the room and according to Sebastian's directions immediately began to play his organ. Miss Reiermeyer hearing the music rushed into the room and saw the ragged boy turning away at his organ in the most energetic manner. Leave off. Leave off at once, she screamed. But her voice was drowned by the music. She was making a dash for the boy when she saw something on the ground crawling towards her feet a dreadful dark object a tortoise. At this sight she jumped higher than she had for many long years before, shrieking with all her might, Sebastian. Sebastian. Take them all out, boy and animal. Get them away at once, she commanded him. Sebastian pulled the boy away, the latter having quickly caught up his tortoise, and when he had got him outside he put something into his hand. There is the ten cents from Miss Clara and another ten cents for the music. You did it all quite right, and with that he shut the front door upon him. Quietness reigned again in the study, and lessons began once more. Miss Reiermeyer now stayed in the study in order to prevent any further dreadful goings on. But soon another knock came to the door, and Sebastian again stepped in, this time to say that someone had brought a large basket with orders that it was to be given at once to Miss Clara. For me, said Clara in astonishment, her curiosity very much excited, bring it in at once that I may see what it is like. Sebastian carried in a large covered basket and retired. I think the lessons had better be finished first before the basket is unpacked, said Miss Reiermeyer. Clara could not conceive what was in it and cast longing glances towards it. In the middle of one of her declensions she suddenly broke off and said to the tutor, may I just give one peep inside to see what is in it before I go on? On some considerations I am for it, on others against it, he began an answer for it on the ground that if your whole attention is directed to the basket dash but the speech remained unfinished. The cover of the basket was loose, and at this moment one, two, three, and then two more kittens came suddenly tumbling onto the floor and racing about the room in every direction. They jumped over the tutor's boots, climbed up Miss Reiermeyer's dress, rolled about her feet, sprang up onto Clara's couch, scratching, scrambling, and mewing. Clara kept on exclaiming, Oh, the dear little things! How pretty they are. Look, Heidi, at this one. Look, look, at that one over there. And Heidi in her delight kept running after them first into one corner and then into the other. The tutor stood up by the table not knowing what to do. Miss Reiermeyer was unable at first to speak at all, so overcome was she with horror and she did not dare rise from her chair for fear that all the dreadful little animals should jump upon her at once. At last she found voice to call loudly, Tanette. Tanette. Sebastian. Sebastian. They came in answer to her summons and gathered up the kittens. By degrees they got them all inside the basket again and then carried them off to put with the other two. When Miss Reiermeyer learned that Heidi was to blame for having the kittens brought into the house, she was very angry and said, Adelaide, you little barbarian, you shall be put in a dark cellar with the rats and black beetles. Heidi listened in silence and surprised to her sentence, for she had never seen a cellar such as was now described, the place known at her grandfather's as the cellar where the fresh cheeses and the new milk were kept, was a pleasant and inviting place, neither did she know at all what rats and black beetles were like. But now Clara interrupted in great distress. No, no, Miss Reiermeyer, you must wait till Papa comes, 
He has written to say that he will soon be home, and then I will tell him everything, and he will say what is to be done with Heidi. Miss Ryermeyer could not do anything against this superior authority, especially as the father was really expected very shortly. She rose and said with some displeasure, as you will, Clara, but I too shall have something to say to Mr. Cece Man. And with that she left the room. Two days now went by without further disturbance. Miss Ryermeyer, however, could not recover her equanimity. She was perpetually reminded by Heidi's presence of the deception that had been played upon her, and it seemed to her that ever since the child had come into the house everything had been topsy-turvy, and she could not bring things into proper order again. Clara had grown much more cheerful. She no longer found time hang heavy during the lesson hours, for Heidi was continually making a diversion of some kind or other. She jumbled all her letters up together and seemed quite unable to learn them, and when the tutor tried to draw her attention to their different shapes, and to help her by showing her that this was like a little horn, or that like a bird's bill, she would suddenly exclaim in a joyful voice, that is a goat. That is a bird of prey. For the tutor's description suggested all kinds of pictures to her mind, but left her still incapable of the alphabet. In the later afternoons, Heidi always sat with Clara and told her of the mountain and of her life upon it, and the longing to return would become so overpowering that she always finished with the words, Now I must go home. Tomorrow I must really go. But Clara would try to quiet her and tell Heidi that she must wait till her father returned, and then they would see what was to be done. After dinner Heidi had to sit alone in her room for a couple of hours, for she understood now that she might not run about outside of Frankfurt as she did on the mountain, and so she did not attempt it. At times she could hardly contain herself for the longing to be back home again. She remembered that Dee had told her that she could go home whenever she liked. So it came about one day that Heidi felt she could not bear any longer. She tied all the rolls up in her red shawl, put on her straw hat, and went downstairs. But just as she reached the hall door she met Miss Ryermeyer, just returning from a walk, which put a stop to Heidi's journey. What have you dressed yourself like that for? exclaimed Miss Ryermeyer. What do you mean by this? Have I not strictly forbidden you to go running about in the streets? And here you are ready to start off again, and going out looking like a beggar. I was not going to run about, I was going home, said Heidi frightened. What are you talking about? Going home? What would Mr. Cece Man say if he knew? And what is the matter with his house, I should like to know. Have you ever in your life before had such a house to live in, such a table? or so many to wait upon you? Have you? No, replied Heidi. I should think not, indeed, continued the exasperated lady. You are an ungrateful little thing to be always thinking of what naughty thing you can do next. Then Heidi's feelings got the better of her, and she poured forth her trouble. Indeed, I only want to go home, for if I stay so long away, Snowflake will begin crying again, and Grandmother is waiting for me, and Greenfinch will get beaten, because I am not there to give Peter any cheese, and I can never see here how the sun says good night to the mountains, and if the gray bird were to fly over Frankfurt, he would croak louder than ever about people huddling all together and teaching each other bad things, and not going to live up on the rocks where it is so much better. Heaven have mercy on us, the child is out of her mind, cried Miss Ryermeyer, and she turned and went quickly up the steps. Go and bring that unhappy little creature in at once, she ordered Sebastian. What, are you in trouble again, said Sebastian in a pleasant voice, as he led Heidi back up the stairs. He tried to cheer her up by telling her he was taking good care of all the kittens. 
but she was too sad to care and silently crept away to her room. At supper that evening she sat without moving or eating, all she did was to hastily hide her roll in her pocket. Next day Miss Ryermeyer made up her mind that she would supplement Heidi's clothing with various garments from Clara's wardrobe so as to give her a decent appearance when Mr. Cece Mann returned. She confided her intention to Clara, who was quite willing to give up any number of dresses and hats to Heidi, so the lady went upstairs to overhaul the child's belongings and see what was to be kept and what thrown away. She returned, however, in the course of a few minutes with an expression of horror upon her face. What is this, Adelaide, that I find in your wardrobe? She exclaimed. I never heard of anyone doing such a thing before. And a covered meant for clothes, Adelaide, what do I see at the bottom but a heap of rolls? Will you believe it, Clara, bread in a wardrobe? A whole pile of bread. Tanette, she called, go upstairs and take away all those rolls out of Adelaide's cupboard and the old straw hat on the table. No. No, screamed Heidi. I must keep the hat, and the rolls are for grandmother, and she was rushing to stop Tanette when Miss Ryermeyer caught hold of her. You will stop here, and all that bread and rubbish shall be taken to the place they belong to, she said in a determined tone as she kept her hand on the child to prevent her running forward. Heidi flung herself down on Clara's couch and broke into a wild fit of weeping, sobbing out at intervals, now grandmother's bread is all gone. They were all for grandmother, and now they are taken away, and grandmother won't have one, and she wept as if her heart would break. She could not give over her sobs for a long time. She would never have been able to leave off crying at all if it had not been for Clara's promise that she should have fresh, new rolls to take to grandmother when the time came for her to go home. When Heidi got into bed that night, she found her old straw hat lying under the counterpane. She snatched it up with delight, made it more out of shape still in her joy, and then, after wrapping a handkerchief round it, she stuck it in a corner of the cupboard as far back as she could. It was Sebastian who had hidden it there for her. He had been in the dining room when Tanette was called and had heard all that went on with the child and the latter's loud weeping. So he followed Tanette, and when she came out of Heidi's room carrying the rolls and the hat, he caught up the hat and said, I will see to this old thing.